Hello and welcome, history fans, to History Play-by-Play. -play. Today, we look at all the other impeachments done at the national level. Stand all alone. Dangle, shut. He scores! Now, this video is a little different. I, if you want a list video, there are literally millions on YouTube. I don't want to become another list video thing. But in doing my research on the impeachment of the various presidents, it came up with other things, and it, I became intrigued. Who are these other people? There's only been 20, including the three presidents impeached. Who are they? And, and I want to set a precedent that, as I tell my students, if something interests you, if you find something intriguing, go chase it down. Go find out more. Go investigate. So instead of just finding out for my own benefit and my own curiosity, I decided to put it together as a video and so we can take a look at who are those other 17 people. So this video is a little different than usual. may run a little long, but uh, know that this is not going to be the common thing. But hey, maybe you want to know. Starting out, it goes way, way back. Uh, 1797, William Blunt was the first person to be impeached by the House of Representatives. All of these are at the national level, and therefore the House of Representatives is who does the impeaching. Uh, the, the man signed the Constitution. Like he, He's way back a major player in the founding of North Carolina as a state. Uh, he became governor of the Southwest Territory that eventually became Tennessee, and he helped make Tennessee a state. The thing is, William Blunt owned a lot of land out in that area and took on a lot of debt in order to get a lot of that land. And the prices kept dropping. There's a lot of land out there. Uh, supply and demand, plenty of supply. It outpaces the demand. Prices go down. And there was also concern. A lot of his land was way out west along the Mississippi River. And he was worried that if the Spanish lost Louisiana to the French the French might shut down our access to it because we were staying out of the French Revolution and we really weren't very friendly and all that, XYZ affair, Alien and Sedition Acts. The French didn't like us for a time. Uh, so he actually tried to make it so that the British would get Louisiana through having the British forces attack along with American militias He's organizing this through letters well outside of any jurisdiction or power that he actually had. Private citizens trying to deal with international relations and land dealings, that's not a good thing. And so uh, they, they moved to impeach him. They actually uh, sequestered his, his Senate seat at the time. Um, and 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 that's not something I don't I don't know that's ever been done since then. They just simply said that you don't count anymore. We're not listening to you. Wow. Um, so he ends up fleeing uh, deep into that territory. Uh, they impeach him. He says impeachment's not meant for senators. It, long story short, he resigns uh, before anything can actually come of it. But to tell you how extreme this was, Abigail Adams was saying that it's a shame that we don't have the guillotines here in America because this is someone who definitely deserved it. Yikes. The second impeachment would be the first removal. Um, John Pickering was appointed by George Washington to the U.S. District Court uh, for the District of New Hampshire. Um, within five years, he's showing mental deterioration, uh, likely dementia, things that weren't clinical terms then. Uh, and, and so he is making some decisions that are very much being questioned by Democratic Republicans. Um, Thomas Jefferson says he's committing blasphemy on the bench, uh, not going with precedent, ignoring things that he shouldn't ignore. Uh, and they, they claim he's intoxicated. They're claiming he, he's an alcoholic. And there might have been some of that, but he, he was getting old and, and certainly dementia or perhaps Alzheimer's was setting in. The House votes to impeach. He uh, is imp Obviously, he's impeached. He's tried in absentia by the Senate, uh, and they convict him on all, all charges, removing him. Uh, so the first removal was because the guy just didn't have it anymore and was making the bad decisions because of it. Samuel Chase would be soon thereafter, and this is actually a significant one that probably should be talked about more. He is the only Supreme Court justice to be impeached. Uh, and again, he has the pedigree. He signed the Declaration of Independence. Kind of a big deal. Uh, the thing is, he was a Federalist. And as a Federalist, he enforced the Sedition Acts, part of the Alien and Sedition Acts, where you weren't allowed to speak out against the government. 
And he definitely enforced it at a level that we might think of as a bit much, a bit cruel. So they impeached him on things, trying to get him on technicalities. They accused him of being too harsh, but that's not really grounds for impeachment. Uh, this might have been a grab for power by the Democratic Republicans trying to remove Federalist judges. That kind of starts to play into our early party, po party politics. It's been since the beginning. Uh, he is acquitted, and there's a lot of questions that the judicial branch needs to be separate, needs to be apolitical, and impeachment should really not be used uh, against anyone in the Supreme Court, though it is absolutely still an option. James Peck, uh, again, still very early, ruled on a lot of things involving the Louisiana Purchase and the land deals involved there. Uh, he ruled against a lawyer who perfectly is named Luke Lawless, a lawyer named Lawless. That you can't make up. Uh, Peck's opinion was published in a mu newspaper. Lawless then posted anonymous, uh, new, uh, uh, anonymous responses in other newspapers. He, the, the Peck finds Lawless in contempt of court, and they tried to say he was abusing his power. He's acquitted because, no, that's pretty much what contempt of court is. Lawless was trying to get an advantage, uh, doing so anonymously. All of it doesn't look good. Um, so, acquitted. West Humphreys. Here's a fun one. Uh, so he was a judge for the U.S. District Court uh, of the Western District of Tennessee. Uh, and, and then when the Civil War started, he served as a judge of the Confederate District Court for the District of Tennessee from 1861 all the way through the end of the war in 1865. Uh, the House impeaches him basically because he's committing treason against the country, publicly calling for secession, giving aid to an armed rebellion, conspiring with Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, serving as a Confederate judge, confiscating U.S. property of U.S. officials, including Andrew Johnson, uh, and imprisoning a Union sympathizer with intent to injure. Uh, obviously, he didn't show up for his trial. They tried him in absentia and got him on all but the one of taking stuff from Andrew Johnson, and, and there was another guy. It doesn't matter. Uh, but basically, they're like, you're a traitor. Get out. And they got rid of him. That's fantastic. Andrew Johnson would be number six. Go see that video. There's a whole separate one about that. Mark Delahay, uh, district judge in Kansas, he was a drunk, uh, and apparently a really bad drunk. Uh, sobriety would be the exception and not the rule. They said he was drunk in court, uh, and he would resign before formal impeachment charges could be brought against him. William Belknap is another significant one. He is the only person who is a cabinet secretary who was impeached. He was the uh, Secretary of War under President Ulysses Grant. And there were some... Uh, well, look, there's a lot of scandals under Grant. He was in one of the smaller ones? Depends how you cut it. Uh, the Trader Post scandal. He's getting kickbacks for the licenses to trade with Native Americans, American Indians, on the American frontier. Uh, creates a monopoly, forcing soldiers to buy only through his people. He ends up resigning, uh, ends, it, the House impeaches him. They're like, no, you're not just going to get away with this. He ends up in a tearful conversation with Ulysses Grant, begging for people to, begging for forgiveness to let him go and all of this. Uh, and, and eventually they will acquit him. And there's questions of, well, now that he's resigned and he's a private citizen, can we actually even touch him? Uh, which really goes unanswered. And I feel that might, might be precedent in the future. Charles Swain, District of Florida. Uh, this guy was just committing graft, and, and a lot of it. A lot of bribes, false travel vouchers and claiming the money from that, uh, private railroad cars that he had no right to purchase, well, rent, um, it, it, unlawfully imprisoning lawyers he didn't like. Uh, it, it, basically, he was corrupt. and But he was acqui acquitted because he was not corrupt enough. Where he was, uh, his, his, their crimes... They're wrongdoings, but the Senate said they weren't high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, which definitely goes into, well, what what does that mean? And it's whatever the House of Representatives decides at that point. Robert Archibald uh, was, was a, another one who was corrupt, buying coal lands uh, from railroads that we were... Railroads were, companies were in court. They end up offering on the side, hey, how about this cheap land we have from the railroad company? Uh, he buys it up and uses it as investment properties. He ends up getting a free trip to Europe. 
in 1910. Uh, again, he's getting kickbacks. He's getting all these improper gifts. Uh, and he is not only convicted by the Senate on five of the 13 articles, but he is disqualified from holding future office. Uh, and there's not a lot saying about how many of those there are. He might be the first one, as far as my research shows. George English uh, basically was, was just being uh, a racketeer with bankruptcies. It's very hard to track down information on uh, what, what was actually happening. They call it a bankruptcy ring, but I think I need some real deep primary source documents to find out what that actually means. Uh, basically, it, it seems like in bankruptcy cases, he was choosing sides. He was being super lenient to certain people who, who did him favors or so on um, and, and just rigging these trials to benefit so that he might make money off of the whole situation or have friends in powerful places. So he would resign before the trial. Harold Lauterbach uh, was accused uh, of appointing incompetent receivers. Bas basically, the same thing as the last one, bankruptcy cases, but he did it the different way. He put people in place who would fail at the job and therefore charge less, and he'd make money off of that. Um, the, 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 the lenient deals, it's the Depression. There's a lot of bankruptcies going on and people looking to gain favorable standings in that. Uh, he would be acquitted of all of those cases, and he would return and serve uh, on the bench for the rest of his life. So, real difference there. Halstead Ritter, uh, Southern District of Florida, uh, he was embezzling money, putting friends in powerful places, favors in bankruptcy cases. Um, he was, he as a judge, he was still being a lawyer, and I didn't know that, but you're not allowed to do that. I guess that makes sense of being like, like you know, excuse me, Your Honor, I'm a judge, I know how this works, you're wrong. I imagine that's a bad thing in a court. So, uh, and receiving proper gifts. Now, he was actually acquitted of all except for the receiving improper gifts. There was a lot of things where he was eating out wherever he wanted and, and no one was going to charge him and, and all sorts of you know, big lavish things like that. Not huge, but at the same time, not right. And so he was removed on just that last charge. Harry Claiborne, uh, here's a fun one. Uh, he was arrested for tax fraud. Uh, he was falsifying his income tax reforms. And when he was finally, so he was uh, charged and tried under this in 1984. 1986, he was going to prison. Law takes time. Uh, and he was still, uh, as a judge in 1986, and he was going to serve a two-year term in prison. And he fully expected that, while well, his seat will be there when he gets back, just going to have an interim guy in the meantime, and then he'll finish out his term as a judge. And the House of Representatives is like, no, you, you can't be in prison and be a, a, a district court judge. That's not how that works. Uh, so they would impeach him, mainly so he wouldn't get his salary while he's in prison. That looks bad, if nothing else. Uh, and there were a lot of questions of, well, if he's a convicted felon, should he be in charge of court cases convicting felons um and and so the in in the removal he would be removed for this they said it's not on his con prior conviction that did it uh they wanted to make it clear that just because you were uh imprisoned at some point doesn't mean you are forever disqualified from serving as a judge they wanted to make it very clear that you could not be in prison and serve as a judge there's a nuance there i'll see hastings this is the most fun, as far as I'm concerned, because it still has an impact. L.C. Hastings at the time was a district judge for Southern uh, District of Florida. He was accepting, uh, charged with accepting $150,000, uh, $150,000 $150, in a bribe to get a lenient sentence. Um, he was acquitted because his co-conspirator in this would not testify. The co-conspirator actually got a lengthy jail term because he wouldn't. Uh, and And Basically, the House impeached him on this bribery case, saying that, okay, they didn't charge you criminally, but you still done wrong, and we're going to get rid of you. We're going to remove you. Um, they removed him on uh, charges of bribery and perjury, and he would be removed from office. But he was not forbidden to serve again. And so Alcee Hastings 
is still in the U.S. House of Representatives for tw Florida's 23rd District. He is in the House of Representatives and it, one of the people who would vote to uh, impeach in future impeachments. Um, he has not faced a significant challenger ever since. He has had a very safe seat. He is on all sorts of committees. You can see his website there, uh, a, a screenshot from it. <laughs> Remember, impeachment can remove you and forbid you from serving in future office. But it does not have to do both of those. So a, a significant case of being impeached and finding a better gig. Walter Nixon, not to be confused with Richard, uh, district judge in southern Mississippi. His son was a uh, son of a business associate. So his friend's son was facing drug charges. Nixon spoke to the prosecutor in that case. Uh, and, and the prosecutor dropped the charges shortly thereafter. Whether there was a connection, that's up to the courts to decide. Well, when interviewed by the FBI and a federal grand jury, he twice, in both of those interviews, denied ever even talking to the prosecutor and having any involvement. That's lying. That's perjury. You can't do that. So he might have been better off just being honest in the whole thing uh, and, and dealing with it. So uh, he was impeached. He was removed. He appealed to the Supreme Court and still lost. Uh, so he, he is still removed, but he is still practicing law in Mississippi. So if you, uh, need a, need a guy to, to help you out with this, apparently he's good at talking to prosecutors. Allegedly. Bill Clinton, there's another video for this. If you, uh, you want to talk about a bunch of maroons, that's one of them. Uh, let's keep going. Samuel Kent, district, uh, in, in southern, uh, southern Texas. Uh, this one got pretty sordid and it's also rather recent. Uh, he was suspended and indicted first on three counts of abusive sexual contact and aggravated sexual assault, or attempted aggravated sexual assault, um, uh, and and that got expanded to six uh, indictments and a number of other things that just, it's not good. It's, it's very, very bad. He bargained it down somehow to one count of obstruction of justice, agreed to retire, which a lot of people had a real problem with, uh, faced a $1,000 fine, whoop de doo uh, $6,550 went to the two victims who were in these cases. That's not enough. Um, eventually, there was a whole bunch of, he can't just resign. Or, or, he's not even resigning. He's retiring, so he'd get his pension and everything. There are a lot of questions on, should he be able to do that? That seems morally repugnant that he's doing that at all. Uh, and, and eventually, he got caught up and sentenced to 33 months in prison. He was impeached on top of that, so he would not keep his judgeship while going to prison and then coming back, uh, and, and his resignation would finally be accepted by President Obama um, instead of going to the Senate trial and, and making this possibly much worse, again, considering that impeachment can only remove you and forbid you from, from serving in office again. So they kind of left it to, okay, the courts have done something, too little, but something, uh, and impeachment's not going to do much more. Thomas Porteous, again, rather recent, Eastern uh, District Judge, Eastern District of Louisiana. Uh, he faced bankruptcy. It, it didn't help. Hurricane Katrina had definitely made a major impact on his, his land holdings. Uh, his wife passed away shortly thereafter. Very stressful time, I'm sure. He was impeached on perjury because he was apparently uh, falsifying his financial income, uh, financial documents, I assume to benefit him in the bankruptcy. Uh, trying to conceal things of value that might have counted in the bankruptcy, saying it wasn't his or, or just forgetting about it. All of that caught up to him. They said it was charged for long-standing patterns of corruption. That was much harder to track down any info on, um, but he would be removed after that impeachment. And finally, the most recent one, I said I wasn't going to touch it, but well, like, we can do it in, in a very basic form, because we haven't seen the fallout of even the Clinton uh impeachment as far as I'm concerned. So Donald Trump is way too close in the rearview mirror to get any actual impact. It's still his first administration. The term hasn't ended yet. Um, so the allegations were that Trump solicited, and this is quote from, from Adam Schiff in the House Judiciary Committee report, solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, to benefit his re-election, that in phone calls and other communications, he was encouraging Ukraine to get information on what he assumed would be uh, his opponent in the election, Joe Biden, and that's problematic at best. The articles themselves 
were abuse of power and obstruction of Congress because in many cases he refused to cooperate with any of the investigations going on in Congress, uh, and he would be acquitted. There is really one significant thing in all of this, and that in, in a presidential impeachment, every single time the president's party has voted with the president. Every time. Every single person has voted, on every charge has voted in favor of the president from the president's party. We get the first time there is an exception to that. In one of those two charges, on the abuse of power, Republican Mitt Romney voted against Republican Donald Trump. But not on the second charge, and obviously it wasn't enough to do any kind of real, real impact. But it is the first time that it's broken. And really, it, that fact kind of sets a tone where impeaching a president is never going to succeed unless you have uh, the, the opposing party in the Senate, which... That's not easy to do, considering that the House probably also needs to be the, oppo the opposing party. And or, or, and or, the president has to have done something so heinous that his party breaks with him. And, I, I mean, unless you're talking about John Tyler, that just doesn't seem to happen very often. So, uh, how much impact does impeachment have on the presidency? We've seen the presidency shrink in power after Andrew Johnson and Congress very much take over for a while. And we've seen the presidential power increase since Bill Clinton. And one would assume that it's only going to continue to increase after the acquittal of Donald Trump. So, that's a very interesting difference in the, the uh, 19th century and now. Big difference. Wrapping this up, because I'm sure you've, you've seen a lot and you're wondering, well, what, what does that mean for the totals? 13 district judges. Uh, if you include the uh, Court of Appeals judge and the Supreme Court justice, many times you'll see the 15 judges have been impeached. Three presidents. Uh, don't forget Richard Nixon. That's what that asterisk is. He was going to be impeached. The articles were drawn up, but they weren't voted on, so he wasn't technically impeached. He resigned before that could happen. We had one governor of the Western Territory, so that's way back. Uh, a governor uh, impeached by the Senate doesn't seem to really be a thing now that that's up to the state legislatures, but it was a territory. So, and one cabinet secretary. Uh, and, and of course, one of these people went on to go and serve in the House of Representatives. So it's certainly not a death knell to your career. Seven acquittals. Eight people were removed, five resigned before they could be removed. So overall, impeachment seems to work at least uh, below the presidency. And because I'm sure you're wondering, I found that 11 governors have been impeached, and that's by their own state legislatures. Four have been removed, and you see them listed there, the most recent being Rod Bl Blagojevich of Illinois. Uh, and he has since been pardoned. So lots more to tell in these stories. There's an awful lot that's a lot more recent than even I realized in the late 80s, 2010, that's recent, uh, and, and of course, the most recent uh, impeachment of the president. So, I had no idea that was that was happening that often, uh, nor did I realize that it was that short, you know, 20 people. That's a manageable number over the, the span of our country. So, there's a full listing, way too long a video, probably won't do something like this again, but hopefully you enjoyed it. So, that is all I got for you. That's the end of the episode. What you just saw is this teacher's interpretation of events. If you use this for a class, let me know how that went in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you can figure out how today's jersey matches the content, let me know in the comments. That's extra credit. I'm John Baranowski, and thanks for watching.